Most of it you can't see. Some of it you can't smell. Part time, full time, we're fighting the same fires, we're around the same stuff. A lot of chemicals and plastics and things like that are found in homes that we didn't face years ago. We're getting cancer at alarming rates now to where we weren't before. And the data is there to show that the exposures that they're getting are causing these cancers. Ten years ago, uh, you wouldn't have found cancer as a kitchen table topic at the firehouse. Now, I can say daily, there is a conversation. Uh, and I, I think we're not an exception. I think that's probably true as a county, as a, a state and nation, that uh, cancer is not the forefront of one of our concerns. Just about every kid at some point growing up says, I want, to be a, I want to be a firefighter, I want to be a fireman, I want to ride around with a big truck, I want to have a Dalmatian. So, you know, you, you, the, you sort of hold them up as these, you know, icons uh, within your community. And you think about whenever there's an accident, whenever there's a, you know, whether it's a car accident or a burning house, these are the folks that show up and take care of you and make you safe. It's not just, you know, riding around the fire truck and making loud noises and, you know, getting to blow through red lights and all that stuff, but it's a, it's a calling. Ask yourself this when you see a firefighter take an inch and a half hose line into a fully involved room with fire. Would you do that? You're never at somebody's house because they're having a good day. Firefighters are called for any type of emergency. It could be a fire, it could be medical, it could be a rescue. Uh, hazmat, you name it. But each time the tones go off, whether a firefighter's life is on the line. Whether they... Whether they go to a fire or they go to a motor vehicle accident on the interstate. Uh, but you know, but there again... Let's we'll let this fire truck go. Huh? Let's we'll let the fire truck go. Yeah. I mean, that's perfect, that's perfect background noise right there. You know, there's a, there, these guys are going to a fire right now and they don't know if they're going to a brush fire out you know, uh, in the median of, of 240. They don't know if they're going to uh, you know, a pallet fire, factory fire like there's in Haywood County. They don't know what they're running into. And that is, you know, I can't imagine going to work every day and being like, okay, today I might face some incredible life or death situations. I might be exposed to different types of chemicals, different types of toxins. Um, and they do it. And to then say, okay, um, now if I get sick, I don't know if that's gonna be covered or not. Fishing is just like everything else in life. You've got to stay positive, stay focused, and on the task at hand. Anything? No. I found it myself. I found this huge mass on my chest, and I knew what it was. I didn't have a, a doubt in my mind. So I immediately went and got an appointment and got the ball rolling. See if you can get anything with that. There's a few days where just I was super physically sick and 
you know, it's stressful, you know, you're always worried, but I, I had to go to work because I'm providing for my family and have a, a teenage son and I was worried about, you know, benefits and, and paying my bills and things like that. And, and then I felt like I needed to be around my normal routine. I felt like that would make me healthy and to be around my firefighters, that that would make me feel like there was nothing wrong and that I would be okay. Is there a secret to finding the right fly? <laughs> We're trying to match what's out here, but um, it's just, it's a little bit of experimentation and we've got changing uh, water conditions. They're, it's getting a little muddy. So we're trying to figure it out. We're having to change flies. And I went through um, uh, my experience in 2017. So I went through um, extensive surgery, um, several rounds of chemotherapy, and then seven weeks of uh, radiation basically every day. So. <laughs> yeah, I love being in the being in the water and chasing fish and being outside. Did you did you cut it off? It, or was it just falling out? It just was falling out. Yeah, all at once. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. I think that was really the only day that I like cried or felt bad. You know, it's when I lost all my hair. Yeah, it changes every second. You never know what, what's going to happen next. You know, there's always some side effect or something that pops up. You know, you think everything's good and then, you know, something will happen or something will go wrong. There's always a new challenge that'll pop up, a surprise. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty new out of out of the treatment, so um, I guess my body's still adjusting. He is a country boy through and through. <laughs> he loves to hunt and fish and be outside, and I mean, he is a shirt off the back kind of guy. There's typically four ambulances here. Two of those are the actual Waynesville ambulances, which is Medic 1 and Medic 5, which are both here right now. This one here has a breakaway in it. So if and when, even, and it would, you would be surprised at the folks that just take this off the door handle and let it go and get in and leave, like it wasn't even there. Uh, in December uh, last year, I began passing blood. Little bits, not too much. Um, Kidneys never hurt. I've never had a kidney stone. It was toward the end of December, middle to the end. And even me, initially, I thought, meh, I'll give it a little time. Uh, this is our uh, administrative, secretary administrative, and she runs the place. <laughs> That's the truth of it. <laughs> if you want something done, you talk to her. Uh, she's awesome. She gets it done. Is that, is that accurate? Some days more than others. You know it is. You know it's right. <laughs> uh, it started in June, May into June, uh, that it was probably 60, 75% blood for the whole time I would be. Like not just a spot here and there, it was red. Um, so I was able in June to get in to the urologist. And uh, went in for an initial consult with her, told her what was going on. Um, she smelled a rat pretty quick, but she wouldn't really say one way or the other because she wasn't sure, so she scheduled me to have a CT. Yeah, this one's a crest line, and it has a really, really good layout. Let me get some lights on for you. There we go. Does it feel good to be standing up in one of these things and not have to worry it about does. the possibility of being in the laying down? It does. I've been here twice. So she did the cystoscopy. There's a TV screen to your left on the wall and you watch the whole procedure. And the very instant that the camera entered into the bladder, she said, that's bladder cancer. She said, that is a lot of bladder cancer and that has to come out. And she kind of panned the camera around the inside of the bladder, but there was nothing but tumor to be seen. When she said, 
it's bladder cancer and it has to come out now, I felt like I was inside of a tornado. Like, the, I remember the room was spinning and I was trying to get out, but I couldn't. And I just looked at Barry and he just looked at me and he said he looked at me and he saw the color just drain from me. Um, and then the doctor, I, I honestly think it really took her by surprise because she'd never had a patient this young. We walked next door to the consultation room and gosh, it felt like we were in there for an hour, but I think probably it was maybe 10 minutes that we were in there waiting on her. And I remember her coming back and I think, I don't think she was, you know, up, upset like we were. But I think it shook her because, I mean, she had not had a patient this young ever to have bladder cancer. I mean, the, the next youngest patient was in their 50s, and he's 36. When you heard those words, bladder cancer, what runs through your mind? Um, deep down, I was expecting it like I really was. I, I knew, my wife knew uh, it. When she said that's when she said that's bladder cancer, and that's a lot of it, and that has to come out. I said, okay. I said, what's the next step? Cancer is not a single disease, but it is uh, multiple different diseases, each having their own origin and project and trajectory in this context. We take on certain risks based on what our parents and our grandparents have experienced. And then those risks might be enhanced by occurrence of exposures over time that can increase the genetic burden of mutations that are associated with these cancers. So put, put and sum all of those together, uh, depending on that background and history, uh, we can be either from a low risk to a very high risk. So a friend of mine uh, joined the fire department back in the late 80s and so in 1990 I came down and um, was just sitting around talking to the folks here and I, I joined and uh, went through the um, red light one day with uh, on, on one of the engines going to help somebody and I fell in love with it and been here 30, 30 years. I'm sure it's changed a lot. It has changed a whole lot, <laughs> yes. I don't think a lot of the people that I came on with knew how dangerous it was. We didn't realize um, how prevalent cancer was. We just thought, oh yeah, we'll go into a burning building, we have to worry about the building coming down, or the fire, or whatever. But it, was, it wasn't about the disease. No, it was a, like a badge of honor to have dirty gear. You know, it looked like you were tough, and so that's, everybody just wore blackened helmets and dirty gear, and it was just part of the culture. I just thought, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. You know, I'm healthy. The message is out now, but it, we didn't know any of that 20 years ago. You wanted to leave it dirty so everybody knew that you had been doing work and all this, and I will promise you, if you'll ask around, that's what you're gonna hear. That's just the mindset, that's the way it was. Our people used to have the turnout gear right next to the bed, so when they wake up, they just throw it on and run out there, and now we don't allow gear past a certain point. We used to go in the kitchen with our gear on and eat. Um, we wouldn't really wash that well after fires. You're, we get dispatched to a structure fire while we're eating. Our food's sitting at the table. We run out, put the fire out, and we come back, we're hungry, and we eat, not really thinking about anything. Um, but yeah, there's a number of things that we used to do that we don't do anymore. Each fire is gonna be different. Each uh, place has got different stuff inside that um, we come in contact on a daily basis adrenaline rush is going on and you really have to sit back and concentrate and take the time to think I've got to watch out for myself also different structures have different burning structures have different risks present different compositions of chemicals in the environment but I've the literature that I've read suggests that there is no combustible products that don't present a hazard and particularly a, ha a risk for uh, in initiating and developing cancer as technology increases to make products, I think that the uh, toxins and the carcinogens 
that are produced when those things burn uh, become more dangerous. We probably didn't see that exposure in the 70s and early 80s because you didn't have the consistency of plastics and polymers. Uh, when plastics burn, they create an entirely different molecule than from the original product. So we don't even know what some of them are. There's so much they're exposed to uh, on the fire ground. You know, it can be said that just about every structure fire now is really more of a hazmat incident than previously thought. So do they need almost a hazmat type suit as they're fighting these fires today versus so it, what they've been using? It, it depends greatly on the type of fire they're at. Uh, but one of the things that we can do is, is look at the gear and what we do here at NC State um, in the Textile Protection and Comfort Center is to, to look at the gear and how do we design it to stop them from ever being uh, in contact with those chemicals. So here we're measuring um, on new gear, brand new, never been used, the amount of water repellency that you get with new gear versus what you get with new gear on 100 washes. And as you can see here, not only is there a visible color difference between brand new gear and after 100 washes, but there is actually pretty considerable damage done even on just some of the trimming. And so one of the, one of the things we're really concerned about is particulates. So when you're looking at the particulates, the smoke, the soot, uh, all that grit and grime that, that used to be all over their gear, all over their skin after a fire, you know, really, you know, it's been said, seen as a, was, was seen as a badge of honor, is, is really holding in the carcinogens, putting it on their skin. So our standpoint is how do we stop that from happening? And so we can look at different types of gear, different designs, putting in different layers that block not only the particles, but potentially the vapors. Um, and stop them from ever getting that dermal absorption uh, on their skin. Um, and then the other thing is their respiratory protection, making sure that if they smell smoke, they really should be on air. If you're in the door, if you're the first crew in and all that, of course you've got air packs on, but that, that's a given. I mean, that's a no-brainer. But the things that get overlooked is overhaul. You know, when the fire's out and you're mopping up and using a thermal imaging camera to look for hot spots and these kinds of things. And uh, a lot of that, in the past has been done and probably certainly to some extent still is done without an air pack on. Now they've taken off their self-contained breathing apparatus and they have disrobed partially. Their airway has been protected during that time. Now it's open. It can, so there, there can then be both uh, inhalation exposures and dermal exposures that put them at risk. Uh, principally from the, the combustibles all from all types of structures, whether they're wood or concrete, the plastics, etc., uh, a huge number of potential carcinogens are released. And they're exposed to that in real time. In times past, we've done that with that piece of breathing equipment off of our back because we've fought the fire for however long and it's caused us to, uh, to tie ourselves down. And with not being able to have the manpower that you would actually need, everybody's got to rotate in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, so with that being said, that's the reason for taking the air pack off of your back when you think that it's safe to do. But we've realized in modern day that that's not the case. So it is a high risk venture and the only control they have over that is their protective gear and the amount of time they spent both within firefighting and in post recovery. Being in the fire service over 20 years, it changes on a day to day basis. So we have to constantly train and um, improve our skills and be aware of all the new equipment and new techniques in the industry. We're all realizing now that we need to educate our members and we have to do different ways of prevention to try and keep our people from getting cancer. We've learned so much more now than we knew before. Multiple sets of turnout gear. You don't have to wear the dirty set that you just came off fire on the next med call or the next structure fire. That's half the danger. You put it back and if you don't have a second set to get into, when you put it on to go to just a wreck, a traffic accident, and you might not end up doing anything but directing traffic. You're still putting that coat on and those pants on, but the carcinogens are still sitting in the material, and you put it on, you're in it again. You are in it again. And through all this, uh, a lot of the guys at Skyland, you know, they, they'd call and check on me, and one captain in particular, he called me and he said, man, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, yeah, make darn sure that your guys 
I said write them up if they don't have an air pack on until they get back into the truck. If it's a vehicle fire, if it's a dumpster fire, if it's a structure fire, if it's overhaul, if it's whatever, I said write them up. If they don't have that on, write them up. I said make them keep a pack on the whole time. Make sure that they're out of their gear and it's in an extractor and they're in their second set of gear. I said yeah, that's what you can do for me. Try to not let this happen to any more than it's already already happened to. One of our chiefs coined the phrase, um, a circle of cleanliness, and, and the idea is you start clean, you end clean. Um, and that goes from the firehouse to your turnout gear to the SCBA to the apparatus. So usually when we do this, there'll be a couple of us and we'll have almost like stations, but I'm the only person right now, so I'll, I'll get it going. So we start with a dry brush to get some of these particulates off. We have uh, decontamination buckets on all of our um, apparatus. This way we're not, like some of the stuff we can get off dry. This way we're not like getting it wet so it soaks into the gear. So when a firefighter comes out of the structure, um, they are to take their Nomex hood off immediately and they get a brand new one from the battalion chief. So now we rinse. And then once, before they get into the truck, we decon their turnout gear and they take it off at the scene, that goes into a bag, it's placed in a compartment in the truck. The firefighter is just in now in plain clothes. They ride back in the cab of the truck without the turnout gear. Once the turnout gear arrives at the station, it immediately is to go into a, a washer, um, an extractor, and then it's to be dried, and that firefighter is to immediately go take a shower. So ideally, you go to a fire with clean gear. We go in and do our job and then we come back out and clean our gear and then again clean everything when we get back to the firehouse. So ideally it's limiting our exposure to, to anything that's dangerous. Is something like that with just a little soap and water and a scrub brush in a bucket, how effective is something like that? It's um, one of the things we always say with this, you know, there, there's never going to be one, say, silver bullet that takes out cancer in the fire service. Uh, it's going to be a lot of things adding up and, and whether that's from our side looking at the gear, designing better gear to ever stop or to stop them from ever being exposed or it's what they can do uh, with, their, with their tactics, with their training. Or, you know, maybe they don't go into the fire as much or, or as far or when they get out. That on-scene decon, there's been studies done uh, where they looked at dry brush decon, they looked at just a, a kind of a compressed air blowing off the suit um, and also looked at wet decon. And so just taking a soap water brush, rubbing it on there, can have a big impact on knocking those particles off. And so when we think about this, the, the particles themselves aren't necessarily the worst part. It's the chemicals that are attached to those particles that they've absorbed in the fire uh, that are the carcinogens. And so if you can get the majority of those particles off the surface of the gear, you're halfway there. And so, so we're trying to figure out ways of, of cleaning things more effectively, whether it's on scene or at back at the station. To do our jobs, we're going to be exposed to those carcinogens or toxins or chemicals or whatever. But ideally, we limit those as much as we possibly can and still do the job that the people that we're here to protect are expecting. I have to keep in mind that here in Swannanoa, we have um, the city of Asheville comes to our fires automatically. So we work hand in hand with those folks. They work hand in hand with us. So if anybody gets cancer, whether it be from Swan or Asheville or from somewhere down east, and it's a firefighter, we just gotta make sure that we're taking care of them. It doesn't really matter what community they come from, what department they come from, they are a North Carolina firefighter. One of the Asheville firefighters um, that passed away, actually, um, I had the opportunity to meet him as he came in for a job interview here. And so he, we hired him um, here at Swannanoa and then he moved on to the city of Asheville. So we knew uh, Will Willis personally. I always respected him uh, as an Ebbs Chapel firefighter and was a great guy and a great family man. And he was a great electrician. He worked here in this house and, you know, he would come over and take care of any problem that we had. and just had a great amount of respect for Will. Will and I worked at the fire station at six, uh, same firehouse. I'd see Will at shift change, he'd come in 
and Will had lost so much weight. He, he was just skin and bones when he was coming in, but he couldn't afford to leave. He had to come in and work, and, and Will did that. He couldn't afford to fight cancer. Um, the medication is you know, 3,000 plus a month, just in medication. I mean, we hit our deductible, but then we're still trying to figure out how to pay for this. So we have to decide, are we gonna lose our house? Are we gonna be able to take care of our kids and our family? Or are we gonna fight this disease? Will was trying to do some things like eat carrots because he thought that was gonna help him. And Will would be orange and skinny and it was sad. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, Will passed with four young children and uh, you know, dad's not gonna be there anymore. Dad's not gonna be there for this Thanksgiving or the next one. Um, it's terrible. And, and it's so unfortunate because he, he got the disease from, from work and he wasn't covered. It really um, puts it right there um, in, in front of us. There, there are people that we, we had uh, very, very deep relationships with and, and were just wonderful, wonderful people. Will told me we could use him in our fight. And uh, I think that we've got to be as proactive as possible. We have to tell these stories and as difficult as it is and share these experiences and let the legislators know that, you know, to do the right thing. Right now, the burden is on firefighters. If they come down with something, they want to file that workers' comp claim to prove that it was the job that increased their risk of developing cancer, right? Yeah, uh, the, the, the presumption is you're, you don't contract occupational diseases on the job. Uh, there are some occupational diseases, for example, that are listed on workers' comp. But North Carolina is defined by the North Carolina, the North Carolina Supreme Court as a slip, trip, and fall state in their workers' comp. So they, an occupational injury is covered, an occupational disease is not, unless it's specifically listed in statute. Even if you listed it specifically in statute, there's still no guarantee that you're gonna be covered. Many other states have taken this issue of presumptive cancer and approved it. Yeah, they have. They've, they have workers' compensation for firefighters and to the best of my knowledge, none of them have gone bankrupt by supporting firefighters with cancer. And so I think our legislators could look around and, and see that we're not gonna bankrupt a state just because they're gonna cover firefighters. When you reach in to break up a fight, right, there's a, a chance that you, uh, you get hit by all parties involved. Um, and I, I think that's true regardless of the issue or, or the legislation. I personally believe that we need to do something. I think that we clearly have people who have made great sacrifices for our communities and for our state, uh, and they're paying an awful price for it that they did not know they would be paying. So I. I Personally, I believe that uh, we have some duty to, to move forward with an action. Um, I also understand the concerns of those who say, well, in every instance, we can't guarantee uh, what causes cancer or what's going on. So I try to be reasonable in that thought. But when you look at the statistics, I, I think it's pretty clear that we know in the vast majority of cases that there's likely no question. A lot of states have what's called uh, presumptive legislation, which means that um, when a firefighter has a cancer diagnosis, that it's presumed it's related to their occupation. And in turn, that provides them with workers' compensation benefits and survivor benefits for their family. So that would be a tremendous help when facing all the bills that come along with a, a cancer diagnosis.
House Bill 520 builds on existing legislation uh, that sort of casually or colloquially we call you know, presumptive cancer legislation. And so the idea is that there, are a, there is a list of cancers, uh, esophageal, um, testicular, that are considered um, uh, line of duty types of, of sicknesses. So if a, if a firefighter dies from esophageal cancer, it's considered to be a worker's comp issue. And so what House Bill 520 does, it expands the different types of cancers. They're, they're considered to be presumed to be created by the job that they do and the exposures they've had to the different toxins, the smokes, the off-gassing, things like that. I think our law is written very well. Um, and I think it has some teeth to it. I know they have concerns with firefighters in other states um, having to go to court and battle for their workers' comp benefits. But I think that some of their legislation that they passed was a little weaker, whereas ours is pretty strong. And so I think if we could get ours passed through the Senate, our firefighters will be in good shape. But why do you think it landed on your desk of, of all desks? Uh, well, I think being a, a Freshman lawmaker, they assume you've probably got the most time, right? You, you don't have as many things to do. Um, no, I, I think because I, I do have um, some long-term relationships with some of the, the House members who were very involved with this topic, uh, they felt comfortable talking to me about it. Um, and there probably is some truth to being a, a freshman lawmaker. Um, when you've been up here for four or six years, you're already working on several large topics, you know, and you have a lot of, uh, lot of balls in the air at the same time. I think that Senator Perry wants to get a good bill passed that's going to take care of the people, and he's trying to do it the right way. Um, I think a lot of legislators who are opposing this have concerns about what it's going to do to uh, workers' comp rates. Uh, affording workers' comp would be an issue. Uh, cities would just have to pay it, which cities have, a, cities have the ability to raise taxes if they have to. So uh, the opposition there would be if we if 520 passes, we're going to have to raise tax or at least pay for it so they can do that. Some volunteer fire departments don't have the resources. So if it passed statewide for volunteers uh, for all departments, then some are really going to struggle uh, with providing workers' comp. It could, it could have an impact on the workers' comp, and I think more research needs to be done to see what that impact might look like. A lot of times, you know, in a standard workplace, uh, those types of diseases and conditions wouldn't be considered a workers' comp issue. You know, if you're working in an office, uh, you know, you, you don't get, uh, you know, it's, it's not presumed that uh, if you get testicular cancer, that that was because of your, your day job, your desk job. Uh, so they have a unique job. They have a unique role in our community and what they do. And so this is expanding those, those protections to make sure that the harm that they're putting self in the way of is recognized. You mentioned, you know, looking at other states. Is North Carolina behind when it comes to doing a designation like this or, or taking some step towards providing benefits to a firefighter? So I, I pride myself on objectivity, you know, and, and it's, I, I see people every day uh, that I'm at the General Assembly that come into my office very passionate about an issue. And if that is all I hear is a, a passionate plea, uh, you think that we're behind on every issue. And I, I think that's probably a little oversimplified. Do I personally believe we need to do something? Yes. But we as a society tend to boil everything down to a, a sound bite, a sound bite or a meme and it's complicated. And as I look at the legislation in different states, um, they, they're, they're different ingredients to their soup. We've heard the state of Texas come up in conversation as we've been asking questions about this. And um, people talking about the fact that despite the presum presumptive cancer legislation in Texas, statewide denial rate for firefighters applying for workers' comp with cancer was still around 90 percent. I don't know, what do you think of when you look, hear those numbers? I think our bill is a lot better than Texas. That's a benefit to being one of the last two states that uh, firefighters aren't covered uh, if they get cancer. I think we've looked at other states and, and their successes and, and their failures, and I think that we've come up with a pretty strong piece of legislation. 
What was the discussion in the legislature when the House took a look at 520? Were there people for it, against it? Well, I think so. I think with uh, some folks are still um, trying to make the connection between are these diseases, is, is there a correlation here or is there a causation here? Um, and so they are still trying to think about, uh, you know, is, is this type of cancer directly related to this, to this work? Um, and so, you know, for some of us, from the data and the research that we've seen, you know, I, you know I'm convinced. Um, and for, for others, they still need to be brought along, I think. Uh, and there, obviously there's a cost associated with it, uh, with expanding those protections. That's the cost of doing business. And we have to accept that as a, as a state in the community, we have to accept that we're going to pay for these things that protect our power project. A representative from the leaky municipalities just said, hey, you know, it's, please, it's not personal, it's just business. It's personal. Uh, when you... Yeah, it's personal. Uh, this is your family when you're here. I can't even imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's personal. So when you plan vacations together, you hang out outside of work and you need something, you call them up because you're, they're your family. You might not have family here, but that's who you call. It's personal. Have you had a personal impact by cancer or anything like that that, you know, you've seen this kind of firsthand or is it just hearing these firefighter stories? So, you know, hearing and reading the stories um, is very important. Um, but I, I also uh, lost my father to cancer. Um, I was three months old, so I grew up without a dad. Uh, so, you know, when you see legislation on this topic and you, you hear um, the stories and, and you, you think about their children, I, I think it, that always tends to, uh, to impact me if I'm to be fair <laughs> and objective about it. a follow-up visit here um, at the Hope Center um, to find out if I could uh, attempt to go back to work as a firefighter. And uh, how'd it go? Good news. I'm going to uh, give it a shot and see what happens, but I got approval from the oncologist today and had a really good visit. So I'm very excited. I'm anxious to be back as a firefighter and uh, be returned to full duty medically. Cool. And then if everything goes okay with your next visit, when might you start? Um, hopefully I'll be starting on the 4th and um, we'll, we'll see what happens tomorrow. So possibly less than a week away? Yes. Well, I better hit the water fountain. Uh, so I'm back for my um, second three month cystoscopy. I have to have one every three months for ever. Um, so this is the second three month cystoscopy. I had the first one back in November. And um, there was um, more new tumor growth in November. So that was another surgery. And so this is three months post the last surgery. So um, I'm hoping through all this, maybe if this one's clean to get to start um, my maintenance chemo plan. There's three years of that. So if this one's clean, maybe she'll feel comfortable with laying out the maintenance plan for the, the three year stand of chemo. What are the feelings this morning? Hey, I, we've been here so much now. I mean, I'm. It's just another, another deal. Probably not for her, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I, honestly, I truly expect there to be more tumor growth there. Just by logic, you know, it, it came back, there was new tumor growth. Yeah, we just, we didn't really talk about it at all yesterday or last night. Um, we didn't talk about it this morning either. It was just get up, do our thing, come here, and just really just pray. And we've been praying for a long time. Thank you. Let's get out with Veronica. Yes. Okay. Right okay. <sighs> Let me hold this. We got it. I'm trying to look at it. Ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey. How are you? Good. How are you? <sighs> so we are scheduling now. So that's the cleanest it has been yet. Yes. So. Yep, so yeah. for at least for at least for now. I'll say that. Um it is uh there was zero you can't even really see the scar tissue where the original big tumor was. Um Do what? You weren't expecting that. No. No, I was expecting there to be more new growth, yeah. Um she it was Monday, I get to start Monday my chemo back so i'll start it monday and i got three weeks of it so it's three weeks seems like the benefits in north carolina only apply to those terminal cases uh that's right so right now north carolina says okay we're going to cover you we agree that you got cancer from doing firefighting and so we're going to give you a death benefit but right now they're saying we're not going to cover you while you're alive so you have to die to actually get the benefit so we want legislators to care about live firefighters, not just dead ones. But it's like now that it's here, it's an epidemic level because there's so many showing up with it that there's years worth of batting cleanup needing to be done that, that can't be done because nothing will get through legislation to pass to let it help, you know? And uh, the, the, the folks that Ash was lost here in the last couple of years, they've been able to of course, declare those line of duty, and and they've paid out the the family of the person uh, that died. But why, why wait until you're paying out a family for the, their dead family member that they can't get back? That's not going to buy them back, you know. Why not pass something now to help um, folks that do have this before it comes to a funeral situation, and the and the family's waiting to see if it's going to get you know, ruled line of duty or whatever, that, that doesn't have to, it doesn't have to come to that, you know? So sure, the state should absolutely step up to the plate. How many cancer types fall under the current death benefits? Right now we have um, four cancers that are covered under line of duty death benefits. And we had more that were being added, but the budget never passed. And so that's, that's where we're at. One reason that members of the Asheville Fire Department have been more open to accepting change where other fire departments may not have because we've had very, very personal examples um, that we've worked with and lived with um, lose their lives or battle with cancer. Kelly and I were fishing and Karen called and then we went went to her. Mm -hmm. What did she say when she called? That she got the diagnosis and you know we, we weren't really sure what it meant and so we just all went and um, we were together just trying to sort it out. I actually remember the first time I saw Karen I was actually in the academy out at the training center and I remember her and another firefighter had ridden their bikes by, road bikes up there, just to kind of check out the new academy, I'm assuming, and I just remember just being amazed at how strong and, and just, you know, wow, here's this female firefighter and I aspired to be a lot like her. And um, just a really happy, upbeat person, very welcoming from the start, and um, again, just, just I remember her on that bike and, and just noticing how physically fit and strong she was and that I was excited to be part of the fire department to be a woman like her. 
we referred to her as Skippy. She was, you know, always just bouncing off the walls, and you know, she was a joy to work for. She was a, a go-getter. You know, if if you said you know somebody needs to climb that tree, she would climb the tree. Karen lived for the outdoors long before she ever started the fire department, and she's she's a big hiker. She's a big kayaker. Anything outdoors, big camping. She was that's her element. Um, it makes me laugh some of the things that she would get into and. I would go to her house and she just loved her garden. She had this enormous garden, but even to be able to get in the garden to pick or to weed or do anything, you had to take your shoes off. You had to be part of the earth as she speaks. So even to this day when I garden, there, there isn't a time that I don't think about Karen. And then moving forward, just as years went by, we, we became closer and closer. And to be honest, Karen was um, basically like a sister to me. Um, she's the closest I had. I, I didn't have family around here. My sister lived hundreds of miles away. Um, and Karen became that person for me. The, the Combat Challenge team was an amazing experience. There were five women. Um, on a team and we competed many years. The competition was just the smallest part of it. What we did a lot of was training. We trained pretty much year long in preparation for these events. Which just built this trust in each other and built this relationship with each other. We would travel to even go train. And we would go to Vegas each year and do a, a, a world competition and one year we came in second. But it was a lot of fun. We had uh, Charlie and Ruth. They would do, uh, Ruth would climb the stairs. And um, Charlie would pull a uh, weighted hose up. Mine was the, uh, the hammer. Karen would drag the hose and, and spray it. Kelly would do the dummy drag. Yeah, those were some really, really wonderful years. Karen was one of the older members on the team and always, but one of the strongest, you know? She always felt like she was the weak link, but she was never the weak link. Part of the competition was she was to hand me the baton. That's probably the hardest part of the whole competition was timing that. And there were times that baton would fly across the, the field and, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's just comical, some of the stuff that happened, but it built and made these memories that I will cherish forever and never forget. Go, 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 come on, Skippy! Let's go, Skippy, let's go, let's go! Why does she get stage four cancer? Why does she get a sickness, an illness that is not curable? We're not promised today, we're not promised tomorrow, and next thing you know they're they're suffering they're going through this and then they're gone and it really impacts you a lot nowadays people there's not a single person that doesn't know somebody with cancer and i didn't know how bad that was i had never known anybody with ovarian cancer let alone stage four and as i started reading up on it um, definitely realized uh, I wasn't gonna have a lot of time left with Karen. Um, the best prognosis was five years. Um, so it was very, uh, it was, yeah, it was super tough to try, to try to understand what I needed to do for her, how I could help her best, what, how I could support her, what I could do to make her life just the best life possible for the rest of her time. Kelly and I stayed with her a lot and I traveled with Karen out of state, like, to get a second opinion and all that, and we spent a lot of time talking, and so, What'd you talk about? Just, she was trying to process, you know, what it meant, and, you know, I tried to help her work through that, and... Had you been diagnosed yet at that point, or...? Yeah, I was all... Okay ahead. I was coming out of it. I mean, I guess you could have, you were there, you were that person she could lean on then, 
somebody who'd been through it. Right. Even though it was different types of right. cancer. Right. But I just wanted to to be with her and be be supportive. And the last few days, all she wanted was popsicles, lemon popsicles, all natural lemon popsicles. They don't make them around here. So one of uh, one of the other women on her support team um, made popsicles, and we kept them in the nurses' station. Station, and every time she wanted a popsicle, she could eat a popsicle. Well, we were just, you know, sh we were close, and I just didn't want to leave her, you know. I wouldn't leave her. I didn't want to leave her at the hospital, and we took turns staying with her, and, and I wouldn't I wouldn't trade that time for anything, and, yeah. She did work for a very long time until it was just too uncomfortable to work. Um, like I said, it, it, and it took over her di her digestive system basically so it was a struggle for her to even eat because her food was not being digested and passed and so it was very painful to eat um, I got to uh, gratefully share the last Christmas dinner with her um, there were there were those moments that um, I'll cherish forever knowing that I got to spend her last Christmas dinner together and us talking about it and um, fearful that she wouldn't be here the next Christmas and she wasn't. She died in January. I mean, I know a few that have been placed on the memorial, but um, it'll mean a lot to, to recognize her, to realize that, you know, what all she went through and, and done, and to have her honored in the way that, that we honor the firefighters, and her name will forever be remembered. If, if something passed in the morning, it's not gonna retro, I wouldn't imagine it would retro pay and benefit anybody from past, but it will help from here on out. Because if, if nothing's done right now, this is only gonna get worse, it's gonna snowball. I mean, stuff is gonna keep burning, firefighters are gonna keep going to put it out, and this is gonna keep happening. The synthetic materials are gonna keep being produced. I mean, this is not gonna stop. It's just, it's just going to get worse. Dr. Steele, you know, would it be unusual to find bladder cancer in someone Barry Coward's age? Extremely unusual. I think his presenting symptoms were blood in the urine. He uh, was drinking Mountain Dew and noticed that every time he did it, he had blood in the urine, which is very unusual. So uh, it goes to your family physician normally and um, send him to a urologist. So that's what we do here in uh, urology. We work up patients with blood in the urine. So, last dose for this uh, first round, what are you thinking? Uh, kind of glad of it, actually. the causes for bladder cancer? Well, there's a number of different causes. Mostly it's tobacco abuse. Uh, but I think with him being in the firefighting uh, field, I think it's the pollutants that they're around. Uh, they get smoke inhalation. They wear the proper equipment, which is appropriate, but it's the 
uh, pollutants are around, uh, burning tires, uh, asbestosis, uh, uh, petroleum distance, gasoline, things like that that are in those fires. If they're breathing those in, they're, uh, they can get polluted from those. But they've changed protocol a little bit since even two weeks ago. So um, once it's in, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to stay in the office for the hour anymore. The initial diagnosis was a high-grade tumor. It was superficial. He did not have any roots. So based on high grade, his age, and then that it didn't have roots, we go ahead and do treatments, which is uh, chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is basically pretty simple. What we do is we put a catheter in the bladder in the office. Uh, we put medicine into the bladder and then we take the catheter out. They go home and they turn 15 minutes in uh, four different directions on a bed and then they get out and they pee out the medicine. It'll be a pretty quick deal and then we'll uh head to the house and start that portion of it, which I like that a whole lot better. I'm actually glad they changed it. And I'll cover you up if you want it. If not, you don't have to. I'm just going to set my... I'll do it. For 15 minutes? Yeah. And then go and I'll lay down and I'll... I'll just start, I guess I'll start on the right side. I'm definitely more emotional, so when he was first diagnosed, I just lost it. I started crying, but he is definitely um, a thinker, and he likes plans and, you know, set steps aside, so we just take it a scope at a time. If the next one happens to be good, great, we'll start the steps of chemo again. If it doesn't, if he has to have more surgery again, we'll go from there. So, because it's never going to be over it's it's over for now I mean he's he turned 37 years old it's an 85 percent recurrence rate she told us the doctor said verbatim it was an old man's cancer he's not an old man so I mean it's not it's not if it's when who approached you I approached him <laughs> that wasn't even at church that was it uh actually he was our youth pastor at the time. It was at him and his wife's house. They were having a a um, Sunday school class meal. And, yeah. <laughs> I kind of made him talk to me yeah, in the kitchen. I was forced into it. They have like a <laughs> an L-shaped counter, not an island, but, and I was getting something to drink. And I, I was in the corner, and I turned around, and she was standing there. <laughs> and that's where I stayed for like 30 minutes. <laughs> I had no choice but to talk. No <laughs> choice. I was stuck. What, what's the chemo to do on Jessica? Um, it makes him very, very tired, um, very lethargic. Um, he has no appetite. He doesn't want to eat. He doesn't even like this, really the smell of food. Um, and he has zero energy. He just wants to sleep. And really that's the best thing for him. Um, is for him just to sleep and rest and the first thing I ever noticed about Barry was his smile I think he has just a wonderful smile and, and I just thought he was a, a neat guy and he had a good personality and you know he made me laugh I've had it in me over an hour already yeah it ends up being closer to two hours yeah. from with him Just coming kidding. home. We were talking um, this weekend how we're coming up on five years of marriage and how things that we thought would have happened haven't and things that we never would have thought have. It's just crazy how what what happens when you really don't know? Let you see how strong you really are. Yeah, and I think that's why I don't really remember much of August. I mean, we didn't sleep in our bed the whole month of August. We were both right here. And I think we both looked like <laughs> not her best.
Mm -hmm. I said, that's the thing. Before this, I could not tell you the last time I had been to the doctor. Like, I just don't, I don't get the flu every year. I don't get, you know. I told him you didn't even have a headache. <laughs> headache, pneumonia, I don't get none of that. And now after this, I'm forced to be very cautious. often get asked, well, why should we provide this benefit to one city employee and not all city employees? And my, my response has always been, if you could find another occupation in the city that shows an increased exposure to cancer, then you should be providing or being alerted to and w working on the same mechanisms we're trying here. Knowing that you know, North Carolina is, is one of the states that's kind of going back and forth with, should we cover these occupational cancers? Uh, for firefighters. It's, it's frustrating for me and it doesn't even affect me. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I can, I can only imagine how they feel knowing that they're putting their lives on the line every single day and the data is there to show that the exposures that they're getting are causing these cancers. With all the evidence now that there is of, of cancers and people like folks of Asheville that have died from it and folks that are living with it and going through treatments and all this, there's no excuse that, that something can't be passed through. I mean, let one of these lawmakers in the House or the Senate have a family member in the fire service come down with some kind of diagnosis or die or whatever, then you'll see something change. But that always goes back. Not until it hits home is something gonna change. And that's, that sucks, that's pitiful. He loved working with the fire department. That's um, that was he was just so proud of his brothers and sisters up there. You know, they never left a side. They were at the hospital every uh, single every day. day, every day. Every they were in day. shifts. They would come, they would come in shifts, and they would call another station and say, "Okay, we're heading out. Like y'all come up now." And I mean, it was nonstop. He was um, really good on the job, and just a pleasure to have around the workplace. He didn't want to let the younger guys beat him. So he was <clears throat> bound and determined to, you know, outwork them in every way he could. You know, even as he got older, he would jump in ahead of the really young guys, and he was he was first in. He couldn't wait. Yeah, but he he definitely held his own and and set an example for all of us. Yeah, I mean, when he got remarried, he had three sons to pick from to be a best man, and he picked one of his firefighter buddies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, Rodney, you Rodney know, they picked, they picked Rodney, you know? He picked Rodney, so. When he started having shortness of breath, we thought, oh, you know, it might just be a little heart thing and he'll go in and get some medicine or maybe have a calf. And then they called and said, you know, he's been diagnosed with leukemia, he's starting chemo today. We were like, whoa. Like it just was, a, it just shook us. We just had no idea that was going to be the case. And it was just so fast with him starting chemo and then, you know, he started having heart complications and he went to ICU. and. And then within a couple of days, he went to cardiac arrest, and that was it. And it was just a real shock. It was just, I mean, That's we... That's fast. And he just went down, and I stayed the night with him on Thanksgiving night, and they let me stay in the room with him in ICU that night. And Chris came and relieved me that morning, and I was gone, what, 10 minutes in the and they called Code Blue on his room. Um, they put him on life support, and that was not our father. You know, we, none of us wanted to go back there and look at him, but we did. Um, my daddy was a good, very good, good, strong man, the best man that I have ever known, and he would not want to live like that. And we sat there with him until his heart stopped beating, and we watched him. We watched him go, um, Eric. Mm -hmm. Remember Eric mm -hmm. coming in? Like One of his brothers came in. It was probably... Yes. Like he said, like his Daddy. firefighter brother, his firefighter, and um, he he didn't realize that 
he, he was know. dying. He, he didn't no know he was on life support. So, um, but if they let him on back, I guess maybe they just thought that he was a part of the family, or and he was. He was a firefighter family, but he came back there and he he said, um, Frank, what's wrong with Frank? And we were all crying, and they're like, Oh no, and um, he was it was so sad because he just wasn't expecting it. Yeah. He went over and he said a prayer in his ear, and he came and he sent Daddy home. Yeah, whatever he said to him, <clears throat> it it did it. It sent him home because he was like three seconds after. He said that prayer. Yes. North Carolina is now considered by the CDC to have widespread transmission. Buncombe County reports its first death resulting from coronavirus. City of Asheville employees from police to firefighters will be tested for COVID-19. Asheville's mayor confirms that all essential staff I guess, start where we left off <laughs> over a year ago. Uh, it, it's been a year, um, you know, it's been a crazy year. Were you concerned with COVID? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, I think it's been a big concern for everyone and, and definitely for me, I've tried to, you know, stay home as much as possible and, and keep the risk down for me and my family. Things have also changed for you work-wise. Walk us through what's changed. Uh, that's right. Um, I've taken a medical uh, retirement from my position and uh, no longer a firefighter. Is that hard to walk away from? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, a big loss. Um, I miss it every day. I miss my um, my coworkers and so yeah. <laughs> so we both got COVID at the very end of the summer um, and he was scheduled to go uh, back to the doctor in August to do his cystoscopy and then start his chemo treatments and we were not able to do that so we had to push it to September um, and so because we were a month later into September the next round was right between Thanksgiving and Christmas exactly mm -hmm. a week before Christmas Day and it yeah. was um, it was hard on him it was rough. So. Well, Scott, a year's passed. The pandemic paused a lot of things. One thing it didn't pause was firefighters getting cancer. There still have been a lot diagnosed over the last year. Yeah, um, all throughout the state. And we've, uh, we lost a firefighter in, in Greensboro uh, a couple months ago to cancer. Um, we had someone else in the department get diagnosed. Do you think that it's taken the state too long to take action on something uh, like this? It absolutely this? has taken too long. Uh, this, this is something that really should have been handled decades ago. Uh, and, and the problem's only gotten worse. Why do you think it has sat in the legislature from 2019 and, and not moved out of the Senate committee? Well, in 2019, uh, we came to a, a standstill essentially over the budget. And a lot of times, uh, as has been the case with some of the firefighter protections uh, but because there is uh, or there are appropriations necessary uh, they got stalled in in the budget process we've actually done this for several sessions and we would lose uh, you know bills would go get passed out of the house they'd go to the senate and and then they would die 
uh, and there was some lobbying efforts against the, the effort that we were doing in the House. Well, you know, the, um, uh, the Senate, you know, operates, you know, by its, by its own rules, uh, and, and they, um, you know, it's sort of like the U.S. Senate, it's considered the world's most deliberative body. Uh, the Senate, in many cases, takes their time. But do you think that lawmakers in Raleigh or maybe even the public at large understand that it's, or have a feeling that a sense of, a sense of urgency about it? So I, I think that the one of the most unfortunate things about this job for me is being exposed to so many new subjects and so many difficulties faced by, by so many. Um, I would not say that I think there's a lack of urgency on anyone's part. Is it just time for the legislature to take some kind of action on this? You know, we've watched uh, firefighters in Asheville, you know, across the state get sick with cancer and, and die is this legislation has just kind of sat there. Well, it, it's important that we continue to make progress and uh, we, we have been making progress. We were a, able to add a number of cancers uh, to the presumptive list a number of years ago. Uh, I certainly wouldn't look at it in the sense that the legislature has been inactive. Uh, it's a, it's a big issue, it's a complex issue, and it's important that we get it right. I, I've gotten no blowback about the topic, um, and as people understand more about the statistics, um, I think that um, they want to do something, and, and I know they do. I, I know everyone wants to be helpful, it's just a matter of how. I guess they see, like you said, those co-workers that are working side by side with them every day, getting a diagnosis, fighting the disease, but not having the benefits. And like you said, things are sometimes a baby step, a baby step. It seems like it's taking long in the legislature then. Well, how do you I, reconcile the yeah. two? <laughs> I, I would say this is a very important issue and it deserves taking time to get it right. I, I certainly believe that that's taking place in this situation. Uh, we can see if he's over here, his office is this way if you want. Firefighters, however, are still expected to be out there on the front lines, just like they were in the pandemic. But the state has been slow to offer any kind of extra benefits. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. Um, you know, we've, we've made the request and we've been trying to get the, uh, the state to move on some cancer legislation. This year is hopefully a different outcome. What are you here at the legislative building doing today? House Bill 535 got filed yesterday. It's uh, Firefighters Fighting Cancer Act of 2021, and it would essentially provide an insurance policy for firefighters uh, when they get cancer. He's not there. When a bill gets filed, to get co-sponsors on the legislation, you have 48 hours. And so we're here uh, walking the halls, going office to office. Uh, we're gonna have a number of firefighters in tomorrow doing the exact same thing. And we're just trying to connect with all of our legislators and let them know how important this is and, and ask for their support on it. What's different about looking at it from an insurance perspective? Well, the, what, what would be different is uh, this would not uh, disrupt workers' comp law as some of the bills in the past would. Uh, this bill, the Senate bill that you see, would create uh, a fund that would help treat firefighters in the event that they were diagnosed with cancer. We have a number of issues, or a, num a number of bills bubbling up here in the General Assembly. One is a, ha a House bill. Uh, that's a bit more comprehensive. Uh, it creates a disability fund. So this time we're going to create the fund from a state coffers and, and, and put 17 million or so dollars into the fund to begin with to get it started. And then adjusting the gross premium tax uh, on, on your homeowners so that it, it, it's negligible as far as the, the, the increase. What my hope is, uh, is that the House will pass their version, the Senate will pass their version, and uh, we'll end up in a conference uh, in some regard uh, to work out the differences and come up with a bill that's better than either of the bills are at this time. If that is passed, that would absolutely be a game changer for these folks going through this because the peace of knowing that you're not snowed all the way under and, and, and just debt when you get out of it, 
would really help the mental health side of it to be able when you're healthy enough to go back to work physically you've got to be healthy enough mentally to go back to work as well and if you're physically well enough to go back to work but you're mentally still at rock bottom you're not going to perform well whatever your job is How do you think this thing should end? I think um, I think we're ending on a positive note. You know, everybody's turning this into a positive. We're making progress at the, you know, with the legislation. That's kind of what you have to do with all the, the bad things that life deals to you, you know. There's always a good peaceful energy out here that'll help get you through. Whatever uh, is dealt your way, a bad blow, you can, you can find some peace out here on the river. Cautiously optimistic, that sounds like a good way of putting it. Right now it's impacting uh, our recruiting. And I, I mean, if I was a, a, a young firefighter, I, mean, I would be looking at the benefits and second guessing whether or not I would work in North Carolina. We have one of the worst retirements already. And then if, if our people aren't gonna be taken care of when they get occupational cancer, why would you come work in North Carolina? You could go right across the border and work in one of the other states that actually take care of their firefighters. I do think the state has been very anemic in that area and dropped the ball big time on that. I mean the promises are nice but it'd be good to, to put some legs on it and let's see it happen. Firefighters need to feel like the lawmakers and the people in, in those roles are backing them up and supporting them and, and they need to feel like it's not all Political, it's not all financial based. It needs to be, you know, about the people, about the families. When Will passed, before he passed, he said, You can use me to do whatever you need to do to help get this passed so others don't have to go through what, what I've gone through. And and there's so many across the state that have have lost their battles with cancer and so this is for them and this is for all the others that that will be diagnosed house committee on health tuesday april 27th 2021 we uh we have six bills today so we're going to need to move along and so what happens is these folks when they're diagnosed with cancer and they can't work but often they often can't uh, succeed on a workers' compensation claim because they can't point to one single fire or one single source that they got, got the cancer from. So they can't work, they're, they're with no income, and on top of that, they've got these large bills for their cancer coverage. These are folks who put their lives on the lines for us every single day to protect our lives and to protect our property.